Maddie from Microsoft. They are both program managers who have really good work from home setups. Um, <laughs> and they're going to be teaching everybody a little bit about um, Microsoft and, and uh, their workshop today is the C Sharp workshop. So this, the stage is all yours. Um, and let's give it up for James and Maddie. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, super excited uh, to, to be here. Yeah, Maddie and I are going to focus in on um, building cross-platform applications with C Sharp, uh, specifically iOS and Android apps, something you may not typically think about uh, using a Microsoft technology. Um, we'll also do some Windows development too, but I'll, I'll show a demo on, on Android working as well, um, the application. So um, let me bring up my slide deck and, and share my screen here. Let's see if this works. There we go. And I'll hit go. Boom. Awesome. So yeah, uh, like I said, I'm James Montemagno. I am a program manager here at Microsoft. Uh, I am a, a team lead and uh, my team oversees building developer communities with .NET. And we'll kind of talk about .NET and what that actually is actually today. Uh, and I've worked with Maddie for, oh my goodness, like forever at this point. Um, yeah, and go ahead, Maddie, go for it. Yeah, I am Maddie Legere. I've been, I think, I'm over three years now with Microsoft, uh, full time on the .NET team, working on our mobile technologies, so Xamarin um, and now .NET Maui and a whole bunch of other cool words that sound like things. Um, I was a Microsoft intern before I came here full time. I did the Garage program, which um, we have some presence in Cambridge, and I actually work in the Cambridge office because I was born and raised in the Boston area. Um, went to Northeastern, so very intimately familiar with MIT, hack MIT. I have a lot of friends who've done it and um, I'm glad to see it's still going. And of course, all the amazing dining options on MIT's campus and in Harvard Square, because weirdly the, their, the options are worse when you get into Boston. So um, yeah, excited to chat with you all. And um, afterwards, James, James and I, like these are our Twitter, so you can reach out anytime. Um, and I'm happy to chat kind of afterwards about internships, Microsoft, you know, MIT externships. If you have heard of those, we take those. It's like the one month in January where you apparently have just like infinite Christmas break where everybody else has to sludge back to school, but you can come work with us for like a month. So that's cool. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's the, oh, okay. We have an externship in the chat here in Zoom. Whoa. So that's exciting. Nice. I'm if I ran into you and I don't remember you, I'm sorry, but it's because we have so many great MIT externs. So that's anyway. awesome. Yeah, we actually uh, a intern just joined my team um, from UCLA. She just started this week, which is really awesome. Yes. Come intern at Microsoft. Um, I think it's a, it's a paid internships, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Paid internships. And then basically just, you know, come work for us. It's awesome. I've been here for five years. Uh, at Microsoft, and uh, I love every single moment of it. It's a really great company and really, really awesome things we're working on. So we're going to be talking about building awesome cross-platform mobile apps with C Sharp and desktop apps too, because you know we got Windows, we got Mac, we got all the good stuff. Now, it's kind of hard to actually know everyone's background on the call or on the live stream. Maybe you're just getting into software development. Maybe you've been doing software development your entire time at, at MIT and before MIT. Uh, and there's a lot of different programming languages out there. And specifically, we're gonna, the one we're going to talk about today is C Sharp. It is one of the programming languages that Microsoft develops and one of the programming languages that's part of the .NET runtime. And we'll talk about what that means too. Uh, but I figure what we do first before we get into the mobile development and actually do the workshop, um, the actually workshop is that GitHub link in the bottom. I'll put it down there. Uh, you can see my beautiful markdown skills uh, that we're going to build is a is a is an app that turns on and off this light bulb right here in my office and changes colors, uh, which is kind of cool. This Philips Hue. And uh, I figured I'd just kind of go over like what C Sharp is, why is it important, and, um, and how does it kind of fit into development all up? Well, C Sharp is an open source cross-platform programming language. It's object oriented. Um, and I'll talk about what that means. And it's a compiled language. Um, so that's kind of atypical compared to something like a JavaScript, which is interpreted language. Um, compiled, um, we'll talk about it, enables you to uh, essentially tell if your code is, is correct or not. It's compiled and it'll give you an error if you typed it correctly, else it will give you uh, no errors if you typed it correctly, you know, so it, it lets you know. Um, it's one of the top languages uh, on Stack Overflow. 
um, um, surveys and also one of the top languages used on GitHub projects. Uh, and it's continually iterating. There's new versions of C-sharp every single year. In fact, C-sharp 10 is about to come out um, this November. So November, we have new releases and there's a new version of C-sharp adding new and innovative features. So I'll talk first about object-oriented and uh, object-oriented programming um, is a little bit different if you were than maybe if you were doing like C programming. And the real idea here is that um, what we want to do is, is, is basically think of um, objects in the real world. Um, and a, a record of that would describe all the properties and all the things that you can do into it. So object-oriented programming or OOP is more that there's structure and objects that have specific properties and methods that you're creating inside of your code. So a record would be like a blueprint. This is a description of what the object is or what it is. So for example, if it's a house, well, it may have properties such as windows and doors and roof and color and it has a patio or doesn't have, you know, things like that. These are different properties. And there could be methods. Like if it was a house, the, the record of the house might have open door and it might, you know, take in what door to open, open window, um, turn on, you know, fire, for example, or something like that. Um, and in object-oriented programming, you're creating these objects in memory. So a full object that you would create would be a finalized house. Another example might be like a dog, right? Properties would be breed, size, weight, color, and then methods that uh, that that actual animal does is it barks, it sits, it fetches, it's run. So they're objects that are created into memory. Now, I said it was a compiled language, and that means that basically um, what happens is that the, when you write code and it's compiled, it's going to convert that source code into a format that can be understood by the computer um, and be executed. So if I say, hello world, it that's compiled and it kind of gives machine code that will be executed on a runtime. Whereas an interpreter, interpreted language specifically isn't compiled. It's, it's interpreted at runtime um, by whatever that interpreter is. So there's like a Python interpreter, a JavaScript um, um, interpreter that is interpreting that code. It's, it's kind of trying to execute at runtime um, what it is compared to executing machine code um, that's there. Like I said, um, C Sharp is compiled, and the compiler that you may see online is called Roslyn. And what's really nice about Roslyn is that the C Sharp compiler is open source. So it means it can be extended, um, it can be improved by the community. Um, it enables the compiler to also give different types of checking, and, and it can basically analyze your code. And then it can tell you if something is wrong or if it has a recommendation. So, for example, if you didn't uh, end uh, in C sharp. We end everything with a semicolon. If you didn't end the line with a semicolon, the Roslyn compiler and analyzer would tell you that and give you an error. And our editors with Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code would display that error. So Roslyn can actually basically compile your code even before you compile your app to let you know if things are correct or incorrect and give you real time feedback. And we'll see what that looks like. So C sharp code is going to look a little bit something like this. This is actually um, a few lines of code. One is correct and one is not correct. Um, but the first thing that we'll see in C sharp syntax is that it kind of looks maybe a little bit more similar if you've done any Java programming. So Java and C sharp are both object oriented programming. They're both compiled. Um, Java, not JavaScript, very different. Um, so it'll look a little bit more similar to that. Or even like something like Kotlin, for example, is also a compiled and object oriented programming. Uh, language. The first thing we'll see here is some uh, keywords that have uh, different syntax highlighting. So using system, it's using this namespace, uh, which gives you access to a bunch of different methods and properties in that system um, uh, name. And one of those is console. So for example, console um, is enables you to write lines and read lines of code. Over here, we get syntax um, highlighting and error highlighting. So not only do we get different colors, 
but we can see that the line below is letting us know that the council should have a capital C, so it gives you that red squiggle under there. And then also it's showing us at the end that something is missing, uh, which is a semicolon, as that is how we determine in C sharp that that is the end of um, that execution block. The dot is an important aspect of, of C sharp. We always dot into objects or into, um, into uh, different methods and classes. So console dot will give us access to any of the properties and methods that are there. So right line is going to be the method we're going to call, and then we're going to pass in properties. In this case, we're going to pass in a string. So a string has double quoted, uh, and we see hello world, which is there. And then, of course, the semicolon at the end ends that console right line. So that's just sort of some of the syntax that you'll see inside of C Sharp. Now, the reason I love C Sharp so much is that it's actually a programming language that you can build for absolutely anything. Anything that you want to build, pretty much you can build it with C Sharp. Whether you want to build a desktop app for Linux, Mac, or Windows, you want to build a web API, a website, you want to build a microservice, um, you can do that. You want to access uh, clouds, whether it's Azure from Microsoft, AWS, or Google, there are libraries that enable you to build C-sharp applications and put them in those clouds. You can build mobile apps, whether it's for Samsung Tizen, for iOS, for Android, for iPad OS, uh, or anything else, you can do that. For gaming, you can run your C-sharp code on a Nintendo Switch, an Xbox, on a desktop, basically anything you name it. Same with IoT, you can run C-sharp code on a Raspberry Pi if you want to. You can, of course, take the data from IoT and put it into different IoT hubs and process that data with AI and machine learning. We have libraries um, from Microsoft and from the community to build and do all of these amazing things. So that's the one thing that I fell in love with when I was in college is that I was learning a lot of different programming languages. And with C Sharp, I fell in love with the syntax and the editors and the tools. But I fell in love with the fact that I could change my career if I started with games, which I did. I used to make games for the Xbox 360 back in the day. If anyone had one of those when you were growing up, then that's, you know, my game was out on the Xbox Live Arcade. I then went to go work for Canon, um, making desktop and web applications for them. And then I moved to Seattle and I became a mobile developer building iOS and Android applications. And in fact, yes, as Maddie put on there, you know, Stardew Valley's written in C Sharp, and uh, there's all sorts of games that are out there that are built in there, which is really cool. So yeah, my, my game is actually on the Xbox One, which is kind of cool. It's called Shred Nebula. It's it's okay. Um, it's the game that I worked on. It was not my game, but I was part of a team. Um, it was my internship project that turned into a job for a few months until it finished, and then we all got fired. So I got to get a job at Canon. That's not too bad. And that's kind of the cool part about C Sharp. Now, I mentioned that there's this runtime because you write C Sharp code and you have to be able to execute it and run it. Well, C Sharp is a really cool um, language and it's one of the languages in the Microsoft runtime called .NET. So C Sharp is one of the programming languages that you can use to target any of those different platforms because the .NET runtime, similar to like a JavaScript V8 engine or a Java JVM, is able to execute your code. And .NET is that, it's a runtime that runs on all of those different devices that enables you to write and execute and run C-sharp applications. There's also other programming languages such as Visual Basic and F-sharp, which is a functional programming language, and all of those things run on .NET. And what's cool about this is it's an ecosystem. So when we, Microsoft, talk about .NET, which you'll obviously you'll hear us talk about a lot because that's the GitHub repo, the website, you'll, we'll, you'll hear us talk about that there's millions of .NET developers, 6 million .NET developers around the globe. It's one of the most loved frameworks on Stack Overflow and uh, one of the top 30 um, highest velocity projects on GitHub. And that, you know, our web framework, ASP.NET Core, is seven times faster than Node.js and C Sharp, the programming language, is that top language on GitHub. And that, you know, many, many new developers are coming into this ecosystem. So when you hear C Sharp and .NET, they're one in one paired together. 
you're just a C sharp programmer and you just happen to run and execute your code on .NET. But there's many frameworks inside of C sharp and the .NET ecosystem, some that I've already talked about here to build for those different platforms. So for example, for our web, we have ASP.NET Core and that's our web framework to build web APIs and websites um, for any different operating system out there. And with C Sharp, what we have is um, for mobile is that it's part of this unified platform. So like I said, whether you want to build for any of these, there's a framework for you and there's a set of libraries and infrastructure and tools that you can use all free and many, many of them open source. Our, our, our tools, Visual Studio is not open source, but Visual Studio Code is open source, but they're all free. Um, whether it's VS Code, Command Line, or Visual Studio, that's a free community edition and, um, and you're good to go, um, which is really awesome. In fact, I personally, in my spare time, I use the free community edition of Visual Studio. So I mentioned here that there are specific frameworks inside of .NET to build things. And what we're gonna look at today is Xamarin. And I'll let Maddie take it away. And you're muted. muted. Okay, good. Yeah, cool. Um, welcome to work from home life. Yeah, okay, so let's talk about um, Xamarin and how you can use C Sharp for your mobile development. So next slide, let's look at some, I think pictures, yeah. So basically when I like to think, um, when I first started out on the Xamarin team, I was like, what is this? Um, why is this cool? And uh, the the way that I started to think about it and learn about it was that in college, I had done Android development. I used Android Studio. I used Java. This is before Kotlin, so I'm showing my age. Um, and I had just never even touched iOS development. I didn't have a Mac. I didn't have Xcode. I didn't have Swift or whatever. So um, I was like, so this is just Android development, but with a different language. And it's it's all the developments in C sharp. Um, and the cool thing about Xamarin compared to some of the other cross platform technologies um, that you might see is that anything you can do in uh, any of the native languages. So they're listed down here. So Objective C and Swift for iOS, Kotlin or Java for Android, you can do those all within C sharp in Visual Studio. So if you kind of want to learn like the one language to rule them all, this is kind of the best choice for you. Um, and, and it's super, super intuitive. And it actually uses a lot of the native um, controls. So the user interface pieces and the native APIs under the hood. So if you're writing specific stuff, it looks like you're writing Android code in some cases, or it looks like you're writing iOS code. Um, but we're gonna talk about how you don't have to do anything specific and you can share it. And the nice thing about Xamarin being um, compiled and then run on the .NET runtime is that the .NET runtime runs natively on your iOS and Android and Windows and Mac devices. So it's just an APK or an app bundle for Android, um, an IPA or whatever it is on iOS. Um, so yeah, so you can just, it's, your phone thinks it's a normal app and it has the native performance of a normal app, which is really awesome. Next slide. So we're all about sharing things here. We like to write as little platform specific stuff as possible. Like, wouldn't it be nice if you could just write an app and then it just runs perfectly everywhere? Um, and that's exactly what we have with Xamarin and more particularly in the, in the UI stack with something called Xamarin Forms. So these are actually demo apps that people in our community built as part of, a, I think a hack week or a hackathon for last October, Hacktoberfest, which is the, the name, which is coming up, very exciting. Um, and these are all built with Xamarin Forms. So they actually used a markup language called XAML, which I, um, the XAML people get really mad at me when I say this, but it's kind of like HTML, but for desktop and with C Sharp. Like there's like, you know, brackets you open and close and there are things in there. And then you can kind of point it to other things that live in the code and the code behind. If you've ever written like a plain old HTML and JavaScript website, it's similar to that with XAML and C Sharp. Um, so you can use XAML or C Sharp to write your UIs for um, Xamarin Forms. And these were all written once and running, in this case it's iPhones, but all these apps also run and look the exact same on Android devices um, and as Windows apps. So next slide. Oh, mine is really slow. So hopefully it's just Zoom being slow. Um, so this is kind of what like the stack of a Xamarin app looks like. 
So we have Xamarin Forms, the UI layer. Um, that's what the, all those apps were built with. That's XAML or C Sharp. Um, but on top of that, you can still write specific code for iOS or Android or any of the other .NET platforms if you want to. So if there's something in your Android app that you really want to like do only on Android, this one specific thing, um, you can do that still in C Sharp. You don't have to bump back to Java or Android Studio and all that stuff. Um, and then there's something else called Xamarin Essentials, which we'll talk about in a sec. But there's also all of your business logic. So when you write an app, you probably have the front end part and then the back end part. Um, a lot of times, instead of calling it back end, we call it business logic because it is more, it interacts with your front end, right? It's not that easy of a split to make. Um, so I like to think about business logic as things like calling APIs, which we'll do, um, you know, setting up databases and authenticating and all those other important things you might do in your app. So that's all shared cross platform. You write it once. It's not really platform specific, but then you kind of get into the situation where you need to turn on like the flashlight or open a link in the browser, um, in the systems browser or read accelerometer data or figure out where the location of the phone is because phones are cool and they have a ton of sensors on them. And what's an app if it doesn't use all those things, right? So that's where Xamarin Essentials comes in. So what you traditionally have to do with you know older cross-platform technologies is go in and say, okay, on the Android version of this app, use this specific Android API that tells the Android device to turn on the flashlight. And then do the same thing for iOS and do the same thing for Windows if you have like a Surface book that has a flashlight or whatever. Um, with Xamarin Essentials, you just do like device dot turn on flashlight or whatever it is. Uh, and it just figures out the right thing to do under the hood for each platform for you. So you just write that one line of code and it, it runs everywhere. Next slide. Nice. So this is kind of um, what the Xamarin Forms controls do like under the hood. So I am not sure how many of you were old enough to like remember what an iPhone looks like when it came out in 2008. But my favorite example of this is if you Google, yeah, James, I know you and I are, those are cool, man, 13 years ago. Um, if you Google a picture of the original iOS settings page, it is so ugly. It has like a blue pinstripe background and it's like really bubbly and all the buttons were like these light blue to dark blue, like gradients with white text. Um, and over time, iOS has obviously become much prettier and more, more modern as time has gone on. Um, and so Android has had a bunch of design changes as well. I just think the iOS settings page is like so blatantly crazy. Um, but with Xamarin Forms, what we do under the hood is we use the controls that the platform would use itself if you were building a native app. So for example, on here, you have like the alert in the bottom left. So the way that an iOS alert looks is it just says, okay, it doesn't have any more subdivisions. It's just the, the header and the bottom. And if you were writing that in Swift, it would be a UI alert view. So that's how you'd write that out in your iOS UI or in your storyboard or whatever you were doing. Um, with Android, the alert looks kind of different. There's a place to put an icon. It's got like different subdivisions for the header and the subheader. And then there's a yes and no action. So when you were writing, when, if you were writing your Android code, you'd call that an alert dialog. Um, and, you know, you could add all those parameters and tell it what the icon is and all those things. So with Xamarin Forms, we give you an alert. And under the hood, we take all the information in that you have. Um, and we say, okay, you gave us an icon. iOS doesn't have a place for an icon, so we're just not going to show that. But we'll show it on Android. Um, okay, you have a yes and no option for Android, but on iOS is just okay. It's just a dismiss or whatever. And we show the user what their controls, um, you know, look like in other native apps. So it feels, looks and feels like the native operating system that you're writing your app for. So the reason I bring up the settings page before I go on this like rant is because with Xamarin Forms, if you built something in 2008, which Xamarin Forms wasn't around yet, but yeah, it's okay. If you did. Um, and iOS with every release decided to change how things looked. Your app would actually modernize with iOS because we're just using their controls under the hood. So when they say that a button should be kind of bigger or should have a different shade of blue text, you automatically get those updates because it's, we're just using what iOS wants you to use. Um, and likewise with Android. So it keeps you modern all the time. Uh, it's very helpful. Next slide. Ooh. Okay, so here are some examples of the things you can do with Xamarin Essentials. So this is uh, the, the kind of cross-platform API level 
um, to not the UI, not what you actually look at on the app, but what the app is doing with it um, when it interacts with the phone's hardware. So yeah, some of my favorite examples, I know I said flashlight, I think I said location, accelerometer. I also think like, you never think about how difficult it is to just like get your camera to open and take a picture or like to save a file or open a file from the file system of a phone. Um, you know, Xamarin Essentials works with that stuff. Um, your preferences for your apps and like get copying to the clipboard and how much battery is left. Like there's a whole bunch of things. It's really exciting. Um, I like using it a lot. So yeah, and it's all kind of bundled in now when you do a file new Xamarin Forms app. Um, you get forms, you get essentials, and you can just kind of go for it. Next slide. Oh, and of course, forms and essentials are both open source. So, That's correct. Um, yeah, we have tons and tons of customers that use Xamarin, Xamarin Forms. We have even more customers that use .NET in general. I am sure if you've been applying for internships, you've seen companies that use .NET. I know um, Carbonite, which is downtown Boston. My friend worked there and they're like, they love Star Wars. They have Star Wars cutouts like all over the office, but they're like a huge, huge .NET shop. Um, and they're, you know, really cool, but I, I don't think they use Xamarin. Um, on this slide, we have a bunch of people who do use Xamarin. Um, and they, some of them are apps you probably use every day. Um, I know that we have a bunch of like food ordering apps that are written with it. So like there's this company called Olo, there's Fresh Direct. Um, a lot of airlines use it, not just for like you booking your tickets and checking in, but also for the pilots to be able to go on their phone and do the checklist to like get the flight ready to launch. Um, Outback Steakhouse's app is built with Xamarin Forms, which I think is lit because I love their bread. Um, yeah, there's a bunch. So we're a super, um, trust, trusted enterprise development tool. So when you know, like go work at a big company and they're like, yeah, Xamarin's great. But we're also really lightweight um, and there's a bunch of startups and like kind of consultants and hackathons and students and people just doing stuff in their free time, um, also using Xamarin as well. So it's not just for all these cool big companies. Yeah. Next slide. That's it. I think we're into little workshop action. So uh, obviously we wanted to create a workshop that we could do, and, and Maddie can field questions as I'm kind of getting into it, um, and do some live coding so you can at least see it. Work workshops virtually is also really, really tricky. Um, so what Maddie and I did is we created a GitHub a project. It's called Office Light Control. And the goal of this application will be to combine a few different pieces of technologies in a workshop that we can do in 25 minutes if you have your machine set up else just watch and try to follow along later or you can download the repo and it has step-by-step -step guide on um, the repo so actually when i go over to this github what you'll see is that there's a um, starter project i'm going to minimize my video here perfect okay uh, when you come over you'll see a few things one is that there is uh, two folders, an art folder, but this office control folder and a solution file. And inside of here is a default project. So if you just clone this repository or download it and open it either on Mac or on Windows, you'll be able to get a starter project. It's very minimal. It's pretty much file new. Um, but the goal of this application will be to control this light. Let me open the camera app. Boom. Uh, that's working. That light right there. You can see it there um, in my office, turn it on and off and change the color of it with my mobile app. Now, uh, since, you know, this is a workshop that's, you know, just uh, 25 minutes long or 30 minutes long or so, we wanted to make sure that it was just something that could be done um, here and there. So if you actually have Philips Hughes at home, you can actually do this with yours et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you don't, then you can try to like follow along and see how it works and get a better understanding, or maybe see how you could integrate it into your light bulbs that you have. Or if you don't have light bulbs, maybe it's a good time to buy some light bulbs um, <laughs> in your in your place. So um, we have basically different setup instructions here. And I know that we had sent them out ahead of time, but Visual Studio um, and Visual Studio for Mac are completely free and available on obviously Mac and Windows. And Maddie wrote up some great instructions on how to get started. So if you're just joining now and you're like, oh, I haven't installed anything, well, you can get started and take a look at it. It does take a little bit of time 
to download and install based on your internet speed. So you can always play this back on YouTube later and just kind of follow along and I'll walk through it. But what's nice is here is after you get through there, what we're gonna do is use if this, then that, uh, which is a way of automating things. And what we're gonna do is I've set up instructions here on how to create a free if this and that account. And pretty much what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, create in if this, then that, these applets called the webhooks. And the idea is that from our mobile app, we can basically ping if this, then that. And when it receives that ping, it is going to um, turn on the lights, turn off the lights, or change the office color lights there. So I have this diagram, as you can see, my sweet, sweet skills in 3D paint of basically walking through creating an applet. And then below, you'll see a full app walkthrough of how to create how to get your API keys, how to create the code. And that's what we're gonna do. And I'm not even gonna do walk through here. I'm just gonna go ahead and do it from the top of my head. Um, but what we have is if this and that, this is my personal account. So I have all sorts of if this and that things. Um, but what I would normally do is click on this create. That's not good. I guess I need to log in again, uh, that button. Oh no, if this and that, what? Good thing I created all of these ahead of time. Okay, there we go. I don't know why I wasn't working, perfect. So when you hit create, you should see something like this. And the idea is to create um, a webhook. So there's all sorts of APIs that you can integrate into if this and that, which is kind of cool. So one thing I can do here is I can say web and I'm gonna create a webhook. And a webhook is um, an API in the internet or a URL on the internet that I can like I said, ping or send data to, and, and, and it will respond to that. Normally in C Sharp, we create a web API with ASP.NET Core, uh, which I talked about earlier. So you can create web backends um, for your mobile apps or for your website, all with C Sharp and, and share code. But here we're gonna say receive a web request and we'd give it an event name. So I'll say like hack MIT, for example, and then hit create trigger. So what's cool is that this gives me a URL on the internet that I can hit to turn on and off the lights. And then when that happens, I'm gonna say, then do this. So here I have Hughes, a Philip Hughes in my house, but you could basically have it do anything. So this is a remote control app, but maybe you have other things. So maybe you don't have a Philip Hue. And you're like, man, I can't do this, but take a look at this list of things that you kind of have and see if there's anything that sort of, I have a switch bot too, oh my goodness. But you know, you could have it send an email, you could do any of these things and you could do that from the mobile application. So what I would be doing here is I would say Hue, Philips Hue, and then link my account to if this, then that. And there's all sorts of things that you can do. Like you can blink lights, you can set a scene in the room, you can do a bunch of stuff. So for example, maybe I could do blink lights and I would pick the light that I have these are not all my lights, I only have a few lights, but it is this office one that I would create. And boom, now I've basically created a brand new webhook called Hack MIT that I can call to blink this light, which is really, really neat. I'm kind of good to go. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the project over here and I'm gonna walk through it really quick, kind of show you what it looks like when you open it up. So, uh, the first thing is I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to show you off the project solution. So in a uh, Xamarin Forms application, there are four projects. Um, so we have these head projects, which is Android, iOS, and Windows, so UWP app over here. And this is going to contain that platform-specific code. So if any of you have done Android development with like Java or Kotlin, there are activities. And this is an activity. This is where the application starts and is installed on, and it's all in C Sharp. So this is the C Sharp version of an Android activity. And since we're using Xamarin Forms, it initializes Xamarin Forms and Xamarin Essentials, and that's all of the Android code. Everything else is shared between Android, iOS, and Windows. Same thing over on iOS. I can click on an app delegate, and I have the starting point of an iOS application, but again, all in C Sharp which is really cool. I can add platform specific things or up here access Android specific APIs if I wanted to. They're all there available to me, but we're not gonna need to do that because everything is shared, which is really cool. 
And again, we also have windows here too, which is really nice. Now, the most important part is that with Xamarin Forms and how we develop apps is all of our business logic, those classes and our web calls and our user interface is 100% shared with this library right here, this office control. So it's actually shared as a reference. We can see it right here with my Android app. So all the code that is here is included in my Android app, in my iOS app, and in my Windows app all automatically. So I can deploy to Windows, I can deploy to, to Android, I can do anything here and I can share all that code. Now, like Maddie said, and feel free to ask any questions in the chat, we um, develop our user interfaces. You can do it in code, but many of our developers prefer XAML, which is an XML slash HTML-ish type of markup uh, over here. And there's also code in the code behind in the XAML.cs or C-sharp file behind the scenes. So this is literally just a file new project. And I'm gonna go ahead and run it here. And we're gonna see what it looks like. So from uh, Visual Studio um, and also in Visual Studio for Mac, there is a play button up top. And here I can see pixel two pi. I can deploy it onto a physical device or onto an Android emulator, like we see here, that'll start to boot up and run my Android application. So what's happening here is actually, it's compiling all of this code in the project. It's compiling the shared code, it's compiling the Android project, and it's going to deploy it to the Android emulator. So it's actually doing all this compilation, checking if the code is correct, and then bundling it up into a native, uh, Android application that will run on this emulator. And like I said, you can also plug in an Android phone and start to um, develop and deploy it onto your Android device. So here's the application. So over here, it has welcome to Xamarin Forms, start developing now. And these are different UI elements. So Visual Studio is very visual. So actually, if I minimize this down, you'll see I have my solution explorer on the right-hand side, I can minimize that. I have output on the bottom, I can minimize that. And on the left-hand side, I have this visual tree showing me everything inside of the application. So I have labels and frames and things like that. Now, if I wanted to, I could just um, kind of show you what this looks like. We have a frame, which is this, this blue uh, frame and it has text inside of it. It says, welcome to Xamarin Forms. And I have a bunch of other labels. So start developing now, make changes in UI, and then a URL that I can uh, tap on. Now, if I want to, I can also come in and start typing code. So here, background color of this frame, I can change the color. Let me go over here. And as I type orange, we'll see all of the different colors with IntelliSense come up, which is actually really neat. So Visual Studio is helping me be productive, write my application. So here I have orange and I just change it to orange. I could say, welcome to Hack MIT. And now what we're seeing is that our development process is using a hot reload. So this is um, part of .NET and Xamarin Forms development is that as I'm modifying my user interface, I can get instant changes to the user, to the, to the actual running application. So here I can delete change anything, add things. So if I wanted to put in a, a button here and say text and say, turn on light, as soon as it's valid here, we'll see the turn on light. I can come on and say, turn off light. I could say change color. And now I have three buttons here. They're fully functional, right? They're all right here inside of my running application. Of course, I'm not doing anything, but I'm adding these buttons into the code, which is actually really, really cool. Um, and there's a lot of features in Visual Studio. So not only these code editors, being able to deploy to emulators, but I can start a live share session where Maddie and I can program together. We get designers and, and all sorts of different things inside of Visual Studio here. I can deploy to GitHub, I can create a DevOps pipeline, I can do all sorts of stuff in this application. But let's go ahead and clean this up. So here, I'm just going to say, I'm just going to delete uh, these uh, labels here. And we see they go away. And um, I'm also going to delete this frame. So now we just have 
an app that has three buttons on it. Um, but let's go ahead and change this here. So here's what's really cool is I'm going to go ahead and zoom in again. And we have a stack layout. So what's neat about this is that this is a layout that holds different controls. So right now it's holding three buttons, but it has other properties on it. So for example, it has orientation, spacing, padding, and other things, and all these other properties. What's neat about Visual Studio is this little star icon. So it's actually giving me recommendations. Um, Visual Studio, something called IntelliCode, which is part of IntelliSense, has analyzed millions of projects on GitHub open source and saw how developers are developing apps. And it gives you recommendations as you're coding. So it's saying that orientation is something that developers often change on the stack layout. So for example, there's horizontal and vertical. So which way you want to stack these items. So if you wanted big horizontal orientation, you can put it here. The default is vertical, the stacking here. I could also change, um, um, let's say the uh, vertical options, which enable me to put things at the start, at the end, or at the center. So I could um, center those buttons over here. There's horizontal options and vertical options. So now I have three buttons in the middle of my screen. And they're all going to tell me to turn on a light, turn off a light, change a color, which is pretty cool. Now I am running this on Android, but I can also, for example, hit start on the Windows project. What I did is I right clicked and I said, set as the startup project. And now I can debug it here locally on my Windows machine too. So for example, this is now going to just boot up um, and compile my Windows application. So I get my, my application that can run uh, on Windows. And you can see my, my device is on, uh, my Windows machine is on dark theme. So I get dark theme right here, which is uh, quite cool. And I can do the same thing. So if I wanted the you know background color to be red, I could go and look at, at this. And now the background here and is all red, for example, and we don't want that, that's no good. All right, cool. So you kind of get some idea of how we're creating UI, but as you know, we saw it's native UI. So it's the native Windows application with native buttons. And if Windows 11 comes out and the native button changes, it's still a native button. So you get the Windows 11 look and feel. When Android 12 comes out or whatever, or 13 or whatever, 14 and 15, 16, 18, you get the native look and feel of whatever Google's UI is for that device. Um, like I said, you can also come in and um, you don't have to be running your application to modify the code. There's actually a lot of uh, tools directly inside of Visual Studio. So here's a full toolbox. It shows you everything that you can add to your application that's in there. So if I wanted to, I could add like a date time picker. I could add a, an image in here. I could add a, a switch, a little toggle, and, and, I, and I could just drag and drop controls and then run the application and, and see it running there. What we want to do is we want to basically get an action for this button. Okay, So right now it's just displaying turn on light, turn off light, change color. So what we want to do is give it an event. So inside of Visual Studio, we'll see that actually the there's different icons here. So this little uh, wrench is a property. So a with request, a background color, it's something that can be set. There's other things, these little lightning bolts, and those are events. So that is when something happens, um, it will call some code that you specify. So it's an action, it's a method, we call that. So there are things like when items have been added or removed, um, there's all sorts of different events, like when it comes into focus, um, that you can, when it gets measured, all sorts of different things, uh, when changes and things are released, for example, when you release the button, um, you would get an event there. But you see all the different properties and all the different things that I can set here. What we want is this clicked event. So we have a clicked event, and what I can do is uh, hit enter and it'll say, hey, do you want to create a new event handler? Yeah, that sounds good. Let's create a new event handler. So that's, that's pretty nifty. And what this has done is in that code behind here. So if I zoom in one more time, I love to zoom. We can see that there's this 
main page XAML, and in the code behind XAML.cs, there's code for that page. So I've created the URLs that we need to put in here, and I'll talk about those here in a second, um, but it's added this button click event for me automatically, which is kind of cool. Like I just described in the UI and it created it for me. If I came in and I said clicked, and I said I could specify the existing button clicked, or I could create a new one. Now it's button clicked one. And I'm like, all right, well, this isn't necessarily like the, the, the best way of de describing this. So maybe I'll call this button on clicked over here. And then we have another one, which is going to be button off over here. And then another one, which is maybe color. So now we have three click handlers that we can write code in, for example. And if we come back over into our page, I can come in and I can say button off. See how it picks up the names. It knows what it is. So here, button color clicked, button um, on clicked. So we get that IntelliSense inside of Visual Studio telling us what to do. Now check this out. Like if I'm not gonna write any code, but I'll show you that now when I go ahead and run this application, whether it's on Android or on Windows, I can do things such as add breakpoints. So over in Visual Studio, I can add a breakpoint on button on and tap on that. And I hit a breakpoint inside of Visual Studio. And that enables me to inspect the state of my application or the parameters that are being passed in. So for example, the sender here is a, is a button. So the button is the sender. It has information about the button. It has all different properties that I can scroll through. I can pin it in here and, and I can uh, you know look at it later. Here it is. I can just look at it all the time and all the different properties. I can also look at any arguments that were passed in. And here they're empty, so there's nothing for me here, but I might pass in different items. And Xamarin Forms is passing me this information by default because I've specified the click here. So basically it displays the native button. And when you click on that, it calls your event for you. Now I don't have anything fancy in here. So, you know, there's, there's not a lot going on. Um, so we can go ahead and stop debugging and we can write some code. So I've created three URLs that we can see up top, turn on URL, turn off URL and change color URL. And the, if this and that API has a very specific URL scheme, which is maker.ifthisandthat.com slash trigger slash the name of the, the, the key that we entered. And then it gives us an API key. Now, API key is specific for everyone. So what we want to do is go in to our um, if this and that, and we can tap on the webhooks and then look at the documentation here. When you tap on that, it'll give you your API code. I'm not, not gonna click on it so you don't see my API code. I'll probably have to reset it after this, but you get the idea that there are, there are a, there's an API code that you would get for your application. So what I'm gonna do is um, we're gonna call these APIs from the mobile app. So we're gonna write a little bit of code inside of each of these um, buttons. And it's gonna be pretty much the same code because all of them are making a web request to if this and that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and type in uh, try, and I'm gonna, I'm basically gonna put this in a try catch block. And what that does is it safeguards my application. I hit tab twice there and Visual Studio fills this in for me. So a try catch block, what that enables me to do is say, hey, if something goes wrong, let's say I lose internet access or that API, that web URL doesn't exist, it's gonna throw an exception because something has gone wrong. And if I don't catch that, then it is going to crash my application and we don't want that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna output the message here um, for the user. So for example, what we can do is we can use a uh, display alert, like Maddie said earlier, and it is going to take in a title, which uh, would be error. The exception has a message, and I'm gonna say, okay, on there. Now we're actually using this asynchronous programming uh, over here and Visual Studio is telling me I need to, uh, I need to uh, add an async flag here. So async away, it's like a promise. And what this does is this is gonna say, hey, I'm gonna go, go do something on the UI. I'm going to go do something. And 
and it's asynchronously happening. So it's not going to lock the UI thread of my application. And that's important when we're making web requests because it may take time to get to if this and that and come back down. So we don't want to tie that up inside uh, of our UI. If it takes time, we want our UI to be responsive. Um, so that's what this async await is. And if you've done JavaScript or Kotlin, there are these promises and, and task-based programming uh, that, that C-sharp has had for, for a very long time. And we use this async and await. So this is saying things are happening and then don't continue. So if I said uh, var ha h equals hello world, basically until this is done, don't execute this code. That's what that's gonna do else code gets executed synchronously. So now we're gonna make this web request. This is super simple. What we're gonna do is we're gonna create something called an HTTP client. And part of .NET and C Sharp is they give you access to all these APIs to, to, to interface with the um, file system for network requests, um, for creating objects. We're basically doing a whole bunch of stuff. It's all part of .NET. So you can do this in any of applications you write in C Sharp. So I'm gonna say, var client. So var is a keyword, which says, Hey, you figure out what it is, um, uh, afterwards. So you don't have to write uh, a lot of words and I'm going to create a new HTTP client. That's it. So this HTTP client lets me do a bunch of stuff. So if I zoom in, I can say client, oops, let me go over here. Client dot, oh, my zoom in is being weird, but we can see, I can do client dot and I get all of this IntelliSense, just like we got in the XAML. So I can do send async, get async, I can post information, I can delete, I can do all these verb things with HTTP REST clients. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say get async, even though it's not getting anything, but it is gonna get um, technically, I'm gonna pass it the turn on um, URL. And this is asynchronous. So again, Visual Studio is telling me that something needs to be done here. So I need to add a wait. And again, it just kind of, writes code for me, which is kind of nice. And I'm done. So there's my turn on uh, light, turn off light and change color light. And now all I got to do is kind of copy and paste code because the only thing that's different is the URL. So turn off URL and over here, I can say uh, change color URL. And again, Visual Studio is telling me, hey, hey, don't forget to add that async uh, over here. That sounds good. There we have it. And then the same thing here is async. And, and the reason we need this async is, is we need to tell the compiler the what to do. So we're telling the compiler that we're awaiting code. So this asynchronous will know how to inspect um, this inside of it. And that's it. That is literally our code. So here again, we create a new HTTP client. We say get and we call a URL. And again, this URL has the specific turn on light, turn off light and our API key over here. So I'm going to run it here on Windows first. Let's go ahead and do that. And I'm going to bring up this. The camera is already running. So there's the camera. There we go. Perfect. Make that smaller over here. I guess you could probably also see it behind me, but I figured I'd have yet another camera to, to zoom in on, on it over here. We'll put this up over here. And I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to add a breakpoint. Why not? So you can kind of see what it's doing here. And then we'll see what happens. We can see if anything happens async. So we can add as many breakpoints as we want. So I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna say turn on light. It's gonna create my new client. It's gonna have my URL that's there. And I'm gonna say continue. And it just called that web API for me. So that turn on URL, it called it for me automatically. It didn't hit an exception, which is super good. Um, and then it hit this other breakpoint because it finished that, that code. And as we can see now, the light is on. If I hit turn off light, this should now turn off my light, just like that. So now I'm basically calling and I'm turning my, my Windows machine here into sort of this IoT sort of hub in a way to turn on and off the lights in uh, my office. I can also hit change light, which turns it to a random color. Sometimes it's a color that is very similar. Uh, so we'll see if it, there we go. So it's changing to a random light. And there's another one where you can pass in different colors automatically to it, which is cool. Now check this out though, is if I change it to Android, I can now come in and hit debug again. 
And that is going to go ahead and now compile all that new code that we wrote over here. And it is going to deploy it oops, over to my, I just dropped the camera. That's good. Over to my uh, Android emulator. So let me set that up again here. Let's see if this works. There we go. And now if I have this in the right place, let's see. There we go. I do. Cool. You can see more of my plant. I can do change color again. And now from Android, it is changing the color, automatically hitting that web request. I can turn off the light. There we go. Turn back on the light automatically. Let's see if it works. There we go. And then change the color again, which is super awesome. So we can go ahead and do that all automatically from this application. Now, if I'm feeling really spicy, we'll see if this works. I haven't, I didn't test it ahead of time. I can set the iOS app as my startup. And I'm going to go ahead and plug in my phone into my Windows machine. Let's see if this works. Maddie. This is the product Maddie works on. <laughs> is for me to be able to plug my phone in. So let's see if this works. I always have different bits on my machine. Let's see if this is going to work. There we go. Trust. This would be cool if it does. Let's see my iPhone. So we have a cool piece of technology called Hot Restart that lets you deploy directly to your iPhone from a Windows machine. So I'm going to see if this works. I do have an Apple developer account. So, all right, cool. I'm going to put this over here so you don't see my code and try to hack my Apple account. There we go. So a bunch of stuff just happened, which is kind of amazing. And now if everything is working, it's now going to compile my iOS application and ideally deploy. And I should be able to screen mirror my iOS application over to this device. It is running iOS 15 latest beta, so it may not work. That's the only thing. Um, it may not work in this, in this case. Let me see, because I am running a lot of betas and previews and stuff. So let me try one more time. I may not. doesn't look like it's going to do it. I may be on weird, 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 weird things. Let me try one other phone really quick, just to see if this will do it. Let me try it. Different iPhone. was getting really, oh, okay. Actually this one, I think did it. Oh my goodness. It's happening. It's happening. Okay. This is very exciting. So I'm going to screen mirror with this application reflector one, six, four, nine, hit okay. Then that should show you my iPhone. Oh my goodness. There it is. Then launch the app. And then now we can see the native iOS application. So it's native iOS buttons. I'm going to hit change color. And now we're going to see the same exact application running on iOS, changing the colors, turning on and off my lights, everything all right from here, which is super cool. So hitting all those different APIs, hitting if this, then that, and then calling that. And you can create this application for anything, basically. So I'm calling it for these uh, hues light bulbs, but you could adjust it for anything at all and run your application all using the same exact code with the same UI, all from Xamarin Forms with C Sharp right there. And that's the walkthrough of there. And again, um, if you do go over to the GitHub project with that, um, that um, Sujay posted, I appreciate that. That will walk you through everything. So if you weren't able to follow along, you know, it's a quick, walk through here, but everything is here for you from calling the API, from running the application. And Maddie did a great job of walking through these different components that you'll need, whether you're on Mac or PC. And I think with that, you can go to dot.net. That's our website that gives you everything you need to get started. You can click on the mobile button. I'll show you what that looks like. Actually, if I just go to dot.net, you can go here tap on mobile, and that will bring you right to Xamarin and get started 
right there. So dot.net, the .net website, and that's it. I'll thanks everyone. Hopefully this was you know a nice walkthrough guiding you through everything. Um, and we're around if you have any questions. Dot 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 net. Yeah, yeah. dot dot net. Dot 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 net. Dot all the dots the dot net. Yes. I have to go to another meeting, but it was oh, cool. a pleasure uh, seeing all of you. So yeah, um, James had my Twitter at the beginning. So rewind the recording on YouTube if you want it and we'll catch up. And great job, James, with an awesome demo. Very cool. I yeah, now uh, you can start changing my lights too. <laughs> that's true. Perfect. Cool. All right. Bye everybody. Good night. Bye, Maddie. I don't know if Jamie, if anyone else had any questions or if you just want to wrap up, totally up to you. Yeah, so I think you guys were right on time. That was <laughs> perfect. perfect one hour. Um, so um, thank you so much, James and, and Maddie, who just left for the for the workshop. And um, we will see you guys at Hacking MIT this weekend. Um, and so that's super exciting. And thank you to everybody who attended uh, Microsoft's workshop today. Awesome. Thank you all so much. If you have any questions, please reach out at any time and come intern for us and then come work for us. It's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> thank you all so much. Have a great hack MIT. All right. Thank you, James. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye.